it's kind of like throwing one pebble into the ocean and it just keeps perpetuating itself. That's the way I think I see Georgia's life. When George died, there was very limited places to go for treatment. We all know that blacks and African Americans have higher rates of cancer, higher deaths from cancer. If you can tell a health outcome based upon the zip code in which someone resides. The data clearly tells us that the outcomes are very different. But we were founded to address just those issues and to improve health outcomes and cancer outcomes for people of color. Prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, diseases that are responsible for driving the disparities we see in our local communities. So the focus of my research is really to figure out why that is. It's very unique and innovative for the George Edgecombe Society, spearheading funding for cancer disparities research. We are working together to engage our scientists really across the entire cancer center. It's allowing us to work directly with populations that need to be attended to. One of the beautiful things about the funding that we raise, it goes straight to the research. We're already seeing research advancements that started. The seed was planted by GES pilot funding. The contributions to George Edgecombe Society are making an impact now, as well as empowering and equipping researchers for the cures of tomorrow. Now is the time, and execution is power. Find out how you can give and be a part of this. Perpetuating a dream, keeping it alive. It's a legacy for the kind of person that he was and the life that he lived. But there's even greater news. I'm happy to report tonight that for the current fifth funding cycle this year, we received the highest number of total grant applications at nine applications. These nine applications were submitted by 15 investigators representing four clinical programs, five research programs. The cancer sites proposed to be researched include breast, head and neck, lung, lymphoma, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. The steering committee anticipates awarding up to four out of the nine applications totaling $300,000. So you see, as evident by the growing number of applications each year, more and more researchers and clinical faculty at Moffitt are focusing their research to address and eliminate cancer health disparities in minority populations. And I wanna thank them, each of them for their efforts and their commitment to this great work. And so now, not only does the George Edgecombe Society fund research projects, but the society also helps to recruit and retain minority faculty interested in health disparities research. Here with us this evening is Dr. Tiffany Carson, who is the associate member in the Health Outcomes and Behavior Program. And we're proud to announce the first George Edgecombe Scholar. Dr. Carson's research focuses on reducing racial disparities and understanding how diet and weight management can be related to cancer prevention. Without further ado, I introduce and welcome Dr. Carson. Well, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Goddard, for this invitation and the welcome and to the society um, for the opportunity to briefly speak to everyone. It is just such an honor and a privilege to be affiliated with this important group doing uh, very important work. And I, I really feel like 
we have a shared mission of improving health in our communities and reducing the cancer burden in Black and African American communities. So, um, you know, I was happy when I got the invitation and just asked to share a little bit about what it means to be a George Edgecombe Scholar um, and the impact that it's had on my research. Uh, but before I get to that, I, I think it's helpful if I provide a little bit of background from, about myself for those who may not really know how I landed here and how I got to this point. So I was raised in Birmingham, Alabama. I've considered Birmingham to be home for many years. I did my graduate training at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I left briefly for a postdoctoral fellowship. And then I returned to UAB to really launch my career as a researcher and do my work in the communities that I consider to be home. Um, I had a, a very busy and productive eight years on the faculty uh, in the Department of Medicine at UAB. That's really when I um, established my research program, which is focused on weight management and healthy diet as a strategy for cancer prevention and control, um, and certainly had a particular focus on Black Americans, just again, due to these documented disparities in health outcomes. And so I guess about this time, maybe about two years ago, I was fortunate to receive two large, um, highly competitive NIH grants. And those grants were really game changers in a couple of ways. So it, it first assured me that I could continue to do research and uh, do the work that I wanted to do for the community. But these awards are also very highly regarded by institutions, if we're just being totally honest. And so it led to me being recruited by not only Moffitt, but several institutions across the country. Um, and, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn at all, but really just to provide some context about how Moffitt rose to the top of the list um, among a field of very highly prestigious institutions. Um, even my hometown tried to keep me there to do the work. But I can honestly say that the George Edgecombe Society and the opportunity to be the inaugural George Edgecombe Society Scholar played a huge part in my decision to choose Moffitt to be my next home to do research. So I remember just when I was you know, being recruited during that time, I think the name George Edgecombe was mentioned probably by at least 80% of the people that I met with during that time. And so I, I just very quickly learned how highly regarded he is as the first Black circuit judge in Florida. And I certainly understand and um, you know, hold that same high esteem for Judge Edgecombe. Um, also that he played such a foundational role in inspiring the establishment of Moffitt Cancer Center. And so this society bearing his name with this focus on cancer health disparities for Blacks and African-Americans, just it really resonated with me and aligned with my personal passion. Um, the support for the George Edgecombe Society by Moffitt as an institution also signaled to me the commitment of the institution to addressing health disparities and to attracting scholars with a focus on disparities work. Um, and so, you know, just the George Edgecombe Society in and of itself was a great appeal. And then when I learned that I was being, you know, offered the opportunity to be the first named George Edgecombe Scholar, it was honestly an overwhelming honor, very humbling, and it just really tipped the scales in Moffitt's favor uh, to become my new research home. You know, just to have my name to be associated with a name and a cause that's so clearly um, and highly regarded at Moffitt just assured me that others saw value in the disparities work that I do and that I would have the opportunity to be a part of something greater, to be supported by and work alongside others with this shared passion. So, you know, being the George Edgecombe Society Scholar, the first George Edgecombe Society Scholar, and receiving the additional funding support has just really given me the opportunity to enhance my research program even further. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of my work in the past has focused on cancer prevention among community participants, but I've always had a vision of um, extending my work across the cancer continuum and working directly with cancer patients to improve survivorship outcomes, especially for Black women. And so the uh, George Edgecombe Society Award has really even accelerated the pace at which I've been able to develop my research in this area. Uh, with the funding that I received as the George Edgecombe Society Scholar, we're currently launching a project to understand barriers and facilitators to achieving or maintaining healthy weights among breast cancer survivors. Uh, we have good evidence to know that this is linked to survivorship outcomes. 
We're also examining unique barriers that are experienced by Black women who are breast cancer survivors so that we can develop ways to address these barriers and promote health equity for Black breast cancer survivors. So as I wrap up, I just wanna reinforce that the George Edgecombe Society is really something very special that we have at Moffitt. And it's an entity that can attract other disparities researchers to Moffitt. It certainly played a major role in attracting me here. And I'm very glad that I came. I look forward to calling Tampa home for this next stage and phase of career and life. Um, I really appreciate the work that you all do. I'm glad to be a part of it, um, the support that you provide. And I just look forward to marching ahead with you. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carson. I, I cannot tell you how excited we are that you joined you know, our Moffitt team and uh, was selected as the first George Edgecombe uh, scholar. Um, and we know uh, that you will set a very high bar for those uh, scholars that will be coming uh, after you. Uh, but we, we certainly look forward to all of the great work that you will do uh, and know that you'll make a huge difference in um, the work in this area. Uh, so now that you've heard from a, a faculty member who was recruited and funded through the George Edgecombe Society, uh, we'd like for you to, to see and to hear from faculty members whose research has been selected and funded through the very generous donations from our donors uh, to the George Edgecombe Society. And so we'd like to begin with a conversation between Dr. Hu, uh, Dr. Lauren Perez. Uh, Dr. Perez is an assistant member in Cancer Epidemiology Program. Uh, they will be joined by Dr. Mo Malafa. Uh, Dr. Malafa is a senior member in the GI Oncology and Molecular Medicine Program. And also joining the conversation is Dr. Michael Schell, who is a senior member in the Cancer Epidemiology Program. So please take it away. Hello, this is Dr. Patrick Hu. We're very happy today to have with us the recent awardees of funding from the George Edgecombe Society. So Moffitt's George Edgecombe Society, which um, uh, goal is to level the playing field for cancer disparities. Uh, we have here Dr. Mo Malafa, who's uh, in gastrointestinal oncology, a surgical oncologist. We have uh, Dr. Lauren Perez, who's in cancer epidemiology. And we have Dr. Michael Schell, who's in biostatistics and bioinformatics. Uh, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you, you so much Hu. for having us. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Wonderful. Why don't we just start with talking about cancer health disparities. Uh, tell us what that is and, and why it's so important to study. So cancer health disparities occurs when there are differences in cancer burden or it can be other um, cancer outcome measures like survival. Uh, that differ for certain population groups, and that can be defined by race and ethnicity, income, education, sexual orientation, geographic location, et cetera. And it's so important to study disparities because we know that there are differences according to um, incidence, mortality, survival by these different uh, population groups. And we need to better understand why there are these disparities so that we can improve outcomes um, in these populations. All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Perez. Uh, Dr. Malafa, can you talk about your grant in colorectal cancer with the George Edgecombe Society? So Dr. Shell and I um, applied to uh, study the impact of aspirin uh, on patients who have been diagnosed and treated for colorectal cancer. Um, we had observed in some preliminary studies that um, aspirin use can actually protect people from uh, developing uh, relapse from colorectal cancer and so could improve survival of colorectal cancer. And so we are uh, looking in depth into those that use aspirin and those that don't. And we're trying to do a very uh, uh, rigorous analysis as to does aspirin really confer benefit? So that's what the work is all about. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shell, you're part of this work too. Um, can you tell us about your role in these uh, exciting yeah. studies? Well, so my role on the project is to be a statistician, which is a, means the numbers guy. 
that I uh, help, help with the, the clinician, Dr. Malafa, to sort out um, these findings. But what we think is going on is the aspirin use that the patients had prior to getting colon cancer may have actually allowed them to have a lower stage of disease. And so some of the stage of disease is actually owing to the aspirin use. And so, um, and so that's where, you know, a, a kind of a more, a more fancy statistical thinking and argumentation is needed to understand um, how some, some factors, some exposures have what are called direct effects and indirect effects. The, direct, the indirect effect may be where it, 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 does it, it helps this, the cancers to grow slower in such a way that they're more treatable. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Perez, you also received funding from the George Edgecombe Society. Uh, what's your project about? Sure, so my project was focused on racial disparities in ovarian cancer survival. Uh, and so black women with ovarian cancer have about a 10% lower five-year relative survival rate compared to non-Hispanic white women. And we really don't know why that is, uh, but the disparity cannot be entirely explained by differences in treatment or access to care. So we're trying to look at other things. So some of our findings show that there are actually distinct uh, tumor DNA methylation patterns associated with survival in black women. And we identified um, in particular a few uh, genes related to ascites and cell motility that were uh, differentially DNA methylated. Um, that were associated with a lower risk of mortality in Black women. So we're also currently working on trying to expand our sample size so we can include a direct comparison of Black to white women so that we can further disentangle the relationships um, and the associations that we're seeing here. The uh, funding from the George Edgecombe Society is so important because uh, this allows a seed funding for these projects, these very exciting projects, that can go on to get very large uh, federal grants and other grants. Uh, so it's really very important. This philanthropy is very important for this work to level the playing field. Uh, Dr. Perez, you wanna uh, touch upon that? Of course. So it, like you said, it, it's extremely important. Um, the George Edgecombe Society grant that I have has actually been used, uh, the preliminary data from that to then apply for federal level funding and I'm currently waiting on my score now to see, but without the funding from the George Edgecombe Society, this work would not have been possible and I would not have been able to generate the preliminary data needed to then go on to, the, to apply for these larger federal grants. Wonderful, I think it speaks to the importance of Moffitt's George Edgecombe Society and the funding uh, that can take these hints uh, in colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, and try to mature these data so that we can uh, level the playing field for these uh, diseases. All right, well, doctors uh, Shell, Malafa, and Perez, thank you so much for being here today, and congratulations again on your uh, research that's funded by Moffitt's George Edgecombe Society. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for that uh, great conversation. And as you all can see, there are some exciting projects happening at the Moffitt Cancer Center. And, and I want to let you know that that is just the tip of the iceberg. So you'll hear about uh, some, uh, some of the other projects that are happening. Uh, but there are so many others that we can't uh, highlight tonight just because we don't have time. Uh, so thank you so much for that conversation. Now, uh, what we'd like to do is to transition from that conversation to something a, a little bit different. Uh, many of you may have never had the opportunity to visit a research lab. And the lab is where the groundbreaking work is taking place. And so what we'd like to do is to give you just a, a small glimpse into some of the uh, work that's happening in the labs at Moffitt. Uh, and as you all know, some of the most exciting discoveries uh, in the cancer field have come from the labs right here at the Moffitt uh, Cancer Center. So what we'd like to do is to provide you with just an up close view of the labs of some of the George Edgecombe awardees. Uh, they'll introduce some of their staff, um, uh, some of the work that they do on a daily basis, trying to uh, contribute to the prevention and cure of cancer. And so we will start with Dr. Dennis Digby, uh, he's an assistant member in the immunology program, and he's a 2019 George Edgecombe awardee where his study focuses on prostate cancer. Welcome to my lab. I'm Dennis Edwidge. 
I'm an assistant member in the Department of Immunology. Uh, my lab focuses on understanding the contribution of the immune system to racial health disparity in prostate cancer, among other studies. So for the racial health disparities studies, we're specifically trying to understand what is the contribution of the immune cells to shaping uh, the course of the disease in African Americans. So prostate cancer is one of those cancers in which African Americans suffer a higher incidence of disease burden as well as disease mortality. And there's a lot of factors that have been described to contribute to this, but we don't really understand very well what is the contribution of the immune system. And this is why we're specifically focusing on, on, on this area of research. I'm going to take you around the lab so that you can you know, get a sense of, of the lab and also uh, introduce you to some of the lab members. Uh, the project itself essentially entails collecting tissues from prostate cancer patients. These are patients that are African Americans or, or, or Caucasian. And then we try to process the tissues after they've, uh, they've, they've been uh, brought to the lab from uh, the operating room. And then we perform a bunch of experiments with the tissues to try to understand the composition of the immune cells, the appearance of the immune cells, the function of the immune cells, and to see if there are fundamental differences in those cells in the African American prostate cancer patients versus the same uh, uh, tumor tissues in Caucasian patients. So let me take you uh, uh, around the lab for a minute. Uh, the lab is essentially two bays. So we have this bay, which is, you know, in that direction, you can see the, uh, the, the, the workbenches. And we have a number of, you know, equipment that we utilize uh, for some of these studies. Uh, here is uh, minus 80 degrees Fraser. This is where we keep the tissues uh, the excess tissue after we're done processing uh, those samples. Um, we have a PCR station right here uh, where we conduct some uh, molecular studies uh, from cells that we've identified from the prostate cancer tissues. Uh, we also have uh, liquid nitrogen. This is where we keep you know, some of the tissues long term. Uh, a bunch of reasons that we use for immune profiling, understanding the immune system uh, in the prostate cancer tissues that catch them here. And these are the workstations where we typically conduct all the experiments. We also have here a little equipment right here. This is what we use to process uh, the actual patient tumor tissue. And then after that, we do additional uh, rounds of processing before we actually get to the point where we start to dissect the, the composition of the immune cells within the tissues. Uh, so over there, so that, that side of the lab is reserved for uh, the trainees and the staff. And this area is pretty much for you know, experiments where all the magic happens. I'll take you over to the South Carolina room. So in here is our tissue culture room. This is where we conduct additional processing of those uh, prostate cancer tumor specimens. Uh, typically, uh, we, we dissociate the tissue uh, with the little equipment I showed you earlier, and then additional processing uh, is usually conducted under the tissue culture group. And here is Natalie, she's doing some experiments uh, related to uh, those uh, studies. Uh, after the additional processing, uh, the tissue eventually gets centrifuged to sort of pellet down with the tissue of the, the cells. And then we 
counts the cells under the microscope and then we put them in, in little dishes and we culture them in uh, one of these incubators. So the bottom is the one that we typically use for the human samples. And then after that, we perform additional studies uh, and additional experiments. Uh, and subsequently, we take those tissues down to another facility, where, which is called flow cytometry. And that's where we actually you know, try to understand some of these uh, differences in the composition of the new cells. So this is uh, essentially the area where all the sterile work you know, takes place. And the non-sterile work takes place outside uh, where we're coming from. And this pretty much wraps up you know, the, the mini tour of my lab. So thank you for watching and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Digby, for that uh, tour. And I want to remind you, if you have uh, questions uh, for any of our researchers, uh, please type them in the chat or comments uh, about anything that uh, you see in their labs. And I believe that all of our featured uh, researchers are here tonight, uh, so they can certainly uh, answer your questions. The next tour is with Dr. Alvaro Montero. Uh, a senior member in the Cancer Epidemiology Program, and he's a 2020 George Edgecombe awardee where his study focuses on ovarian cancer. I'm a Fulbright Exchange Scholar. Uh, my project deals with uh, the analysis of uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants from Africa. Hello, my name is Alvaro Montero, and in this lab, we are interested in genetic factors that influence the risk for cancer with a particular focus on breast and ovarian cancer. Welcome. I'm Awate Priyaki from Tunisia. I'm a Fulbright Exchange Scholar. Uh, my project deals with uh, the analysis of uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants from Africa. My name is Samuel Lodoviki. I am a postdoctoral fellow from Italy. Uh, my project is focused on the identification of factors that can enhance response to barb inhibitors that are a class of anti cancer drugs used in breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. Hi, my name is Thales Nepomuceno. I'm a postdoctoral fellow from Brazil, and I'm leading the George Atcom project. We have been using uh, functional data in the lab to help uh, classify variants of BRCA1 and BRCA2 as pathogenic or benign. Now we are actually interrogating the impact of the ancestry of the cell lines we use to do the tests, African versus Northern and Southern uh, European. Great, thank you, Dr. Montero. For this next tour, we have Dr. Anna Gomes, uh, who's an assistant member in the Molecular Oncology Program, and she's a 2021 George Edgecombe awardee, where her study focuses on lung cancer. Welcome to the GOMS lab. In our lab, we study how aging affects the tumorigenic process. In particular, uh, we focus on lung cancer and on metabolic changes that occur as we grow old that shape the tumorigenic process, because aging is the main risk factor for lung cancer. This is uh, Hussein Kashfi, a postdoc in our lab, and he will tell you a little bit about uh, his project. Uh, in the context of um, lung uh, cancer disparities. So I'm investigating how age-induced reprogramming of circulatory metabolism affect lung cancer and the disparity of lung cancer incidence in African-American population. At any given chronologically age, African-American populations are approximately three years older biologically than Caucasians, suggesting that the age-driven factors and changes that promote the tumor genesis may be exacerbated in African-American populations. So my project is to see whether this is the case by evaluating how, how lung cancer cells derive from 
Caucasians versus the uh, African American populations respond to specific uh, age related factors. And this is Dr. Ilter, uh, a research scientist in our lab, who also works on uh, lung disparities uh, with different races. Um, for this project, we wondered if mitochondrial haplotypes can explain the differences observed in lung cancer in Black people. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells, and they have their own DNA, in addition to the DNA that's normally found in the nucleus. The mitochondrial DNA is inherited through our mothers, and the differences in these DNA are uh, grouped together by scientists to form haplogroups that help us track um, maternal lineages. Um, this represents a striking and often overlooked difference between people of different races. Mitochondrial DNA affects the functionality of mitochondria, so it helps uh, creating metabolically different environments for lung tumors to thrive in. We use mice that have the same nuclear DNA but different mitochondrial DNA to see if, the different, if these differences can account for the lung cancer disparity observed in the African-American population. Thank, Thank you, Georgia Film Society. Society. Thanks so much, Dr. Gomes and uh, your research team. I uh, really appreciate that. And our final tour is with Dr. Ron Rao Bueller. Uh, he's a research scientist in the tumor biology program, and he is a 2021 George Edgecombe awardee where his study focuses on prostate cancer. Hi, thank you for taking time this evening to learn about the exciting work being done at Moffitt Cancer Center focused on cancer in the Black community. My name is Dr. Rob Rambuler, and I'm a research instructor in the Department of Tumor Biology. And I would like to briefly discuss with you a project of mine that has been generously funded by the George Edge Film Society, looking at prostate cancer in African American men. African American men have twice the prostate cancer incidence rate and over twice the rate of mortality from prostate cancer compared to other races. Therefore, there's a critical need to understand what causes this, and more importantly, what can be done cl clinically to help fight this disease in African American men. I'm proud to be working with a team here at Moffitt Cancer Center that includes Dr. Kajay Moa, Dr. John Park, and Dr. Xander Berglund. Together, we found some of the molecular differences in prostate cancer between African American men and other races. One of these differences is differences in a metabolic pathway called the polyamine pathway. Polyamines are critical to all living cells uh, on the planet. So, and in the case of cancer, many tumor cells have higher levels of polyamines compared to normal cells. So if we can figure out a way to reduce levels of polyamines in tumor cells, this may be beneficial to cancer patients. So my project is focused on one enzyme in the polyamine pathway called ornithine decarboxylase, or ODC. Importantly, in o the ODC gene, there is a single little genetic variant, a variant of just one single nucleotide in the ODC gene that's been nicknamed the ODCA allele. The ODCA allele is more commonly found in African Americans than it is in other races. The ODCA allele has been shown to cause increased rates of ODC levels in cells, and in a cancer prevention trial, it has been shown that a drug that targets ODC works better in men with a family history of prostate cancer than the, for men who carry the ODC allele than men that do not. So my project is focused on two questions. The first question is, does the ODC allele work as a prognostic biomarker for African-American men? Will it tell doctors which African-American patients may have more aggressive prostate cancer early in their treatment and allow them to uh, provide more, more clinically uh, relevant treatments to these men. And so what I have done is I took DNA from over 600 prostate cancer patients and checked it to see whether or not these men carry the ODC allele or not. After doing that, I looked at their medical history to determine which ones had worse outcomes and what I found is that African-American men that carry the ODC allele do have worse outcomes 
than African American men that do not bear the ODC uniform. Therefore, this could be an important prognostic biomarker to, do, to let doctors know that these men may have more aggressive prostate cancer as it develops. The second part of my project is to look at whether or not a drug targeting ODC will work better if men carry the ODC allele or if not. And so in order to do this, what I'm planning to do is to develop two prostate cancer cell lines that are exactly the same genetically, except for one will have the ODC allele and one will not. And then I'll be able to compare these cells side by side to determine their differences in tumor biology and more importantly, whether or not they respond to the ODC targeting the drug. Upon doing this, this will give clinicians important information that can help patients and uh, move forward into the clinic to treat African-American men who have prostate cancer if they carry the ODC allele. So I hope this, um, I'm hoping I'm getting to get these cells very soon and to get this work rolling, and hopefully we'll get some good results um, that can help African American men. Thank you once again for taking time this evening, and thank you once again to the George Edgecombe Society for funding my project. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Rob Bueller. Um, really appreciate it. A big shout out to all of these researchers and their teams for taking the time to open up their labs just to give us a small glimpse into uh, the world that they live in. Uh, now we want to get uh, we want to get a little personal. Uh, we know that uh, all of what we do is centered um, around the patient uh, and their family. The patient is the core of everything that we do. Uh, patient testimonials are so powerful for just reminding us of why we do this work and why this work is so important. You know, we're fortunate to have with us uh, this evening Mr. Gary Lambert. Uh, Mr. Lambert is a Moffitt patient. Uh, he is uh, living with multiple myeloma, and he has graciously agreed to share his cancer journey with us uh, this evening. So welcome, Gary. Oh, welcome. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to share my screen for the slideshow. Everything okay? Yeah. All right. So Gary, we don't see your screen yet. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, there, there we go. Coming. There you go. Yep. All right. Good evening, everyone. So I'm here to talk about my cancer journey. So in the year or so before my diagnosis, life was actually going pretty well. I was 37, married to my wife for eight years, father to a five-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. I was working as a probation parole officer in Philadelphia and in Philadelphia, and I changed my lifestyle to got fit to the point where I was, you know, I was doing half marathons and I had recently done a 100 mile bike ride. My biggest health concern at the time was my seasonal allergies and a lifelong battle with asthma. You can see in my semi-athletic <laughs> glory in the photos, along with my wife, Nadia, and our kids, Ethan and Ava. Shortly after that 100 mile bike ride, those were uh, my photos around the time I got diagnosed or right before I got diagnosed. Uh, shortly after that mile, 100 mile bike ride, I was feeling a lot of hip and back pain. I took it easy for a while, but the pain wasn't going away. My doctors did x-ray and you know they came back clean. I started physical therapy and then got worse. Uh, my PCP said, you know, maybe I had a herniated disc. By November of 2014, sitting was a torture, torture and standing was even worse. I was hobbling around with a cane. Things became clearer in December when something showed up on an x-ray. My doctor ordered a bone marrow biopsy. The day before at 38, 38, I had stage three multiple myeloma. Over 80% of my bone marrow was involved and I had lesions up and down my spine. The compression fractions in my spine was the main source of my pain and intermittent numbness. Two weeks later, I started my first line of treatment, RVD. Revlimid, Valcate, and Dexamethasone. 
plus Zometa to strengthen what was left of my bones. A stem cell transplant was next on the list, was the next step, but I had to do the preliminary test. We found that the Velcade had damaged my heart. So we swapped it out for Kyprolis and I got to add a whole cardiology team to my collection of doctors. I was eventually cleared for the transplant and completed that in October of 2015. I had hoped for remission, but I got a very good partial response, which is still better than nothing. I was on a low dose Revlimid maintenance for nearly two years when my numbers started creeping back up. We moved to Darzalax and dexamethasone monthly infusion. Things got stable, but with so much damage done to my body and the risk of injury and infection at work, a change was needed. The, over, the arrival of COVID only made the decision clear. We chose Tampa to be closer to family and honestly, because we knew Moffitt was the expertise to deal with my condition. So in September of 2020, we packed up and moved it into our new home just outside of Tampa. Later that month, I had my first appointment with Dr. Blue. I immediately knew that he was the person to oversee my treatment. I continued with Darzalax and Dex until last month when my numbers started climbing up again. So here we are at the fourth line of treatment, cytoxin, dexamethasone, and palmolist. Given a finite number of treatments available, we are moving towards CAR-T and hoping that in the meantime, I can keep my numbers down. The photo on the right is me looking overjoyed to be stuck in the hospital during my transplant. Now that you know so much about me, it should be obvious why I would want to be treated at Moffitt. I had already experienced high quality care in Philadelphia with both Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and UPenn. But more than that, I'd taken part in support groups and patient forums where others had to travel to other states and sometimes even other countries to get affordable quality cancer care. Moffitt checked all the boxes, accessible to our new home, accepted my health insurance, a reputation of excellence in the cancer field, and, a highly, respect, and highly respected doctors. I searched for a black oncologist that specialized in blood cancers, which is almost like hunting for a unicorn, but I was fortunate to find Dr. Blue at Moffitt. From day one, he and everyone from the techs, interns, nurses, to the infusion team have treated me with respect and compassion. When you're going in every week or every month to be poked and prodded and filled with chemicals that build up, that build you up and break you down, it's so important to have that kind of support. Cancer has changed my life in more ways than I have time to explain. I have such gratitude for my family, especially my wife. She has been the caregiver, the breadwinner, the person who gets rattled by the neuropathy twitches in the middle of the night, the person who had to get used to the dex mood and moods and insomnia. The person who is there when I feel like it's all too much. I would not be able to do anything without our support. I've also learned to understand my body so much better. Not surprising when you're reading your lab results every week and reviewing your EKGs and MRIs and managing the side effects of 12 different pills plus infusion. It's like med school, but you're both the student and patient. Cancer has changed my priorities as well. I always loved coffee and dreamt of having my own business, but it got pushed to someday. Well, someday became July of 2019, and I'm now, and I'm not here at Moffitt or sleeping off meds. When I'm not here at Moffitt or sleeping off meds, I'm roasting coffee and making cold brew. Sorry. Another thing that has become meaningful is the connection, was connecting with others like me. I share my story at events like this in support groups and to others online. It's obvious that cancer sucks. I had to accept that. There are no more 100 mile bike rides in my future. I had to have many difficult conversations with my children and know that there will be more of those to come. Even with insurance, the weekly copay adds up. I'm often tired, cranky, and all of the weight I've lost when I was healthy has returned and invited extra friends along. I've had at least half a dozen bouts of pneumonia, fell and fractured my knee, a few rounds, rounds of blood clots, lost hair in my head and only half of it came back and was temporarily allergic to my own sweat at one point. Oh, and I once got a random infection that sent me to the ICU for two days with my blood pressure, when my blood pressure bottomed out. While I have not given up, 
The reality of my situation is not lost on me. It's there that every ache, despite that, or maybe because of that, I know that my life and my story can impact someone else. So I've compiled a list of do's and don'ts for others in my position based on my experiences as well as other cancer patients I've met over the past seven or eight years. Get screened. Choose providers that are comfortable, choose providers that you're comfortable with because your life is literally in their hands. Ask questions. If that means a referral, a second opinion, or a third, do it. Research on legitimate sites. Choose an app. Research on legitimate sites. Choose an advocate to carry out your wishes. Sit, uh, sit in on visits and ask questions. There is really, this is really important for patients that cannot advocate for themselves. If you have health insurance, maintain it. If we had to pay out of pocket for just every for just my meds, we would be bankrupt. Make lifestyle changes to help deal with the symptoms and the side effects. Don't ask, do ask for help, whether it's a ride to the pharmacy or a shoulder to cry on and have honest conversations. One of the worst things I've ever experienced in people is, when, is people sugarcoating their condition and then their families are blindsided when things go wrong. And there are the whole bunches of don'ts. If you don't feel right, get it checked out. Early detection saves lives. Do not get your medical advice from social media or pseudo medical websites. Do not skip medical visits. It's scary to hear test results, but avoidance could cost you valuable time. This is a big one for me. Don't get hung up on why me and why cancer. You don't get a good answer. And if you're focused on the past, you can't live in the present. Don't compare. I have a leg tattoo that says run your own race. And it's so true. There is no medal for the Cancer Olympics. We're all just doing the best we can in our own way. And finally, do not define yourself by your cancer. I'm a husband, a father, son, brother, friend, business owner, and coffee snob. I also ha happen to have multiple myeloma. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of this amazing event. Wow, thank you so much, Gary. What a, uh, just a powerful uh, testimony, powerful story. And we just want to thank you so much for your willingness to uh, share with us this evening. And uh, I am sure that you are helping many, many people, um, at, you know, who may be going through the same journey. Uh, so really appreciate uh, your willingness to be able to be open uh, about your own journey. Uh, and as you know, we have said over and over and over again at Moffitt that uh, your courage uh, inspires our courage. So thank you so much, uh, Gary. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, there are some uh, questions in the uh, chat, uh, but because of time, what we'd like to do is to maybe ask you to uh, ask those questions when we are in the uh, breakout session. Uh, so if you have a question in the chat, uh, either ask it in the breakout session or if our researchers will look in the chat and if it's a question that you can answer, if you will type your uh, uh, responses in there, that would be so uh, very helpful. Uh, so now it's time for us to hear from uh, all of you, want to hear what's on your mind. So there are three breakout sessions uh, that will be led by Moffitt, uh, a Moffitt researcher uh, and a clinician uh, to discuss either uh, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, or multiple myeloma. And so uh, when prompted, if you will select which breakout session you would like to attend. And after the breakout session, we will return just for a brief moment uh, for closing remarks from Lauren Rucker, who is a part of the Moffitt Foundation team. And she serves as the Associate Director for Health Equity. So we will see you uh, after the breakout sessions. Thank you, thank you so much. I don't know about you all, but we had a great discussion over um, in the uh, multiple myeloma uh, breakout uh, session. So thank you all so much, um, our physicians and researchers in that room. And I'm sure you had the uh, same type of uh, lively discussion in the other rooms as well. It was fantastic and the community asked questions. Yes, yep, absolutely, absolutely. I know we are right at our time, uh, but before, uh, we turn it over to uh, Lauren Rucker for uh, the closing uh, remarks. Uh, I just want to say on uh, behalf of uh, our leadership, Dr. Hu, and uh, our other executive leaders, I uh, just want to thank you all so much for joining us 
uh, tonight. Um, I mean, this is huge. Uh, we will continue to work hard to address this issue uh, because we have the support of our most senior leaders to get this done. Uh, and certainly we would be remiss if we did not uh, give a big uh, shout out to uh, Kenesha, uh, Avery and the entire team uh, for all of the hard work that they uh, did to put this thing together. So give them a virtual uh, round of applause. Wonderful, thank you so much. And now uh, we will give the last word to uh, Lauren uh, Rucker, who is representing the uh, Moffitt uh, Foundation. So Lauren, you wanna close us out? Thank you, Dr. Green. My name is Lauren Rucker. I am the Associate Director of Health Equity for the Moffitt Cancer Center Foundation. I like to extend my deepest gratitude for your attendance this evening. And I would like to give a special thank you to the following people. Uh, of course, Mrs. Dorothea Edgecombe and her family, uh, CEO, Dr. Patrick Koo, the chair of the George Edgecombe Society, Ms. Valerie Goddard, um, accountable officer and senior faculty member, Dr. Green, as well as the uh, GES steering committee and the research selection committee, uh, committee. And of course, all participating faculty, as well as teammate members and especially Special thank you, of course, uh, for your courage, Mr. Uh, Gary Lambert, for sharing your story. Um, and of course, I echo uh, Dr. Green uh, with a huge thank you, thank you to Kenesha Avery, Dr. Vada Parampal, and the entire CEO, COEE team. Um, of course, as we know, cancer is a battle that affects all communities, but health equity and the work that we're doing to close the gap in health disparities is just the reassurance that everyone has the armor to fight that battle. And that's what the George Edgecombe Society represents. And if you would like to join, uh, of course, the George Edgecombe Society as we level the playing field, like Dr. Who says, feel free to reach out uh, to me at Lauren Rucker, uh, at lauren.rucker uh, at moffitt.org. And I'll, of course, drop that in the chat for you as well. And also visit us on our website. And again, thank you again. Uh, I cannot thank you enough to all the researchers for explaining, of course, uh, their difficult um, work and, of course, the passion behind that work. And it would not be possible uh, without the donors um, raising over $1.5 million to uh, put together this amazing work. And, of course, if you'd like information or updates on the George Edgecombe Society and how you can be a part of closing that gap on health disparities, feel free to reach out to me via email or on our website if you or your corporation would like to be involved. Involved. Um, so thank you again for an amazing evening. And if you have questions, please let us know. Um, and of course, on behalf of the George Edgecombe Society and Moffitt Cancer Center, thank you for attending. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. Have a great thank night. You.